Okay, welcome everybody. We're going to uh, make a start. Probably a few people will come and come and join us. Uh, but thanks very much for turning out bright and early on this Sunday morning. And welcome to the first of our sessions on the battle for democracy. We're running it in collaboration with our strand partner, the UK in a changing Europe. And in this session, the first of them we're asking from referendums to citizens' assemblies, does democracy need a makeover? I think even the biggest fans of the democratic system which we've had for most of the last hundred years would admit it's looking a little frayed. We've got rival sides in the Brexit debate accusing each other of denying democracy. We've got government gearing up for a people versus parliament election. And across Europe, we've got established parties rocked by insurgents who are then going on to challenge cherished liberal democratic norms. And maybe small wonder, if you think if our best effort at democracy is using a little stubby pencil to mark our choice from a limited range of candidates once every four years with an X, what used to be the symbol of illiteracy, then perhaps it's no surprise that democracy is seen as being ripe for reinvention. And there's no shortage of suggestions as to what that reinvention might be. We've had calls for more referenda, more citizens' assemblies, beloved of everyone from Extinction Rebellion to the Gilets Jaunes, and as of yesterday, the UK Parliament. And there's calls too for more direct democracy, uh, probably as enabled by the internet. Uh, that's been promoted by Italy's Five Star Movement, among others. And some even suggest it's time to go back to democracy's roots in the Athenian marketplace, when participating in decision-making, as long as you were a man and you weren't a slave, wasn't just a right but a duty. Could, could, could democracy even go so far as implying a citizen's duty to uphold and even implement the decisions they've taken? Are we only, in other words, just getting started on the democratic path? So that's some uh, food for thought for our panellists, um, to unpick that little lot. Got an excellent panel, introduce them in, in order of speaking. Uh, first, Polly McKenzie, Chief Executive of Demos, so she should know of what we speak. Uh, Polly started out as a journalist, then was a policy advisor to the Liberal Democrats, Ed Davey and Nick Clegg, and ended up, I believe, drafting the agreement establishing the coalition government of 2010. So that was representing one interpretation of the democratic will as expressed at the ballot box. Uh, subsequently, Polly played a key role in establishing the Women's Equality Party before going on to set up Demo 2 and take over as CEO of Demos. Then Alan Renwick, uh, Deputy Director of the Constitution Unit at University College London. Alan's been described as one of the UK's foremost scholars of democratic reform and also as a lovely bloke, but he doesn't half know stuff. <laughs> he set up the UK Citizens' Assembly on Brexit and produced a report entitled Doing Democracy Better. So shortly he'll tell us how. And then Rosalind Fuller, uh, she's director of the Salonian Democracy Institute, which I'm sure I don't need to tell you lot, takes its name from Solon, the Athenian statesman credited with laying foundations for ancient Greek democracy. Uh, a lawyer by training, Rosalind's written a range of books including Beasts and Gods, How Democracy Changed Its Meaning and Lost Its Purpose. And last but not least, Jim Panton, James Panton, Head of the Upper Six and Head of Politics at Magdalen College School, Oxford. Uh, Jim was also an is also an Associate Professor of Philosophy at the Open University, he previously taught at a number of Oxford colleges. He's a founder member of the Manifesto Club, which campaigns against the hyper-regulation of everyday life and he's co-editor of the gloriously titled From Self to Selfie, A Critique of Contemporary Forms of Alienation. So that's our panel. The way we're going to do this as normal at the battle is each of them is going to speak in turn for uh, five to seven minutes max. So I'm going to use our cherished yellow and red cards. One minute to go, please stop talking. Uh, and then what we're going to do is throw it straight open to you guys and get some good discussion going. So to kick us off, Polly, please. Uh, hello, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, so I, I, I'm going to do some performance art in honour of Boris Johnson by not having prepared at all, uh, and I'm just going to wing it. Uh, I might make some tired jokes that I've made before and just hope that people still laugh. 
Um, so I think the question for me is whether our democracy, with all of this noise and screaming and shouting and energy, is in fact democracy in kind of rude health or democracy in a, in a crisis. And I, I think I, 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 I celebrate the fact that Brexit and, and then climate change seem to have activated and energised people uh, in a way that is, is much more inspiring, really, than um, the sort of end-of-century arrogance that we had when people were talking about uh, the end of politics, which is a, a pamphlet which was put out in 1999 by, by Demos, uh, a sort of uh, poor man's version of uh, the end of history, the Fukuyama book. But, um, the idea that all of the difficult arguments had been settled and now we just needed to sort of worry about the little stuff and everything was going to be fine. And so I, I don't completely despair when I look at the energy in our political debate at the moment, but I do, I do worry and I worry profoundly because actually democracy is about a collective process of decision making. Uh, and it has to sometimes settle answers to solutions that people can live with. And it has to be able to therefore tolerate uh, compromise and agreement. And I worry that we are um, losing some of the skill for that. And, and this is profoundly worrying because the scale of change that we in the whole of the West need to face is, is simply unimaginable. Uh, we have not just climate change, uh, but also a kind of a demographic change that we've never experienced before, both in terms of an aging population and uh, the beginnings, I think, only of a wave of immigration and the likes of which the world has never seen, which could last for hundreds of years and just continue to get bigger. Uh, partly as a result of climate change, we've got this shift of global power east. Um, we have got uh, this the way that technology is disrupting and. Uh, uh, and disconnecting not just our economy, but the way we engage together as people uh, and our democracy itself. So, in a way, everything is changing at a pace which is alarming, and our ability to discuss and come to agreement about the way forward seems to me to be undermined by a, an increasingly winner-takes-all form of politics, which is really about uh, crushing the saboteurs, uh, winning by a hair margin so that you can just ignore the views of everybody who didn't win uh, and they can just kind of sit down for a few years or, or preferably a generation. And I think that is really problematic. And, and so I, if, uh, this is my first time at the battle of ideas, but I, and of course, there should be, there should be a, a, lots of discussion <laughs> and uh, a passion and energy and commitment about the ideas of politics, but actually, for me, the the concepts of battles suggest uh, a victory for a side, and I, I actually think democracy has to not be about that. But uh, there's something about the way technology is affecting campaigning in particular that undermines our ability to build consensus. That this, uh, the micro-targeting, uh, hyper-personalization of political promises, uh, means there isn't a, a political commons in the same way. The people will see a whole different set of promises and therefore enable a different set of expectations about what the party they vote for is going to deliver for them. We're talking about democracy as if it's a consumer transaction and using the technology which has been, been built uh, and funded by uh, the advertising industry in order to give us all very hyper-personalised experiences of what shoes we want to buy. Uh, which is now enabled by kind of 3D printing and <coughs> incredible diversification of consumer products. But the problem is that you can't diversify the government, right? In the end, there has to just be one of them, and we all have to share it. Uh, and so using that hyper-personalised hyper advertising is incredibly dangerous for the way in which it destroys the political commons. And we've talked about that with regards to Brexit in particular, but it is not just Brexit. People can get very hysterical about that. Um, but when you have a, a situation where, you know, for example, the um, uh, people of South Asian heritage were promised that we should leave the European Union specifically so that we could have more immigrants from India, 
whilst another group of people were told we should vote for Brexit because we should, so that we can just have less immigrants altogether. You know, that is a problem when people are singled out, put in their boxes and given messages that nobody else can see. And our, our, our inability then to regulate this transformation of political campaigning is, uh, for me, a symbol of, of the extent to which the whole of government is unable to respond swiftly enough to the changing landscape of, of, how, we, uh, of how we manage technology, partly because it's so busy just eating itself alive, parties becoming increasingly unrepresentative increasingly uninterested in, in compromise, in collaboration. You know, the, the number of MPs who have resigned it because of abuse, but also because of a sense that their, the party, the 100 or 200 people in their local party, are the most partisan, the most aggressive, the most uncompromising, uh, and the least able to, to tolerate the idea that actually politics is about compromise, uh, about working together. Um, and I don't think we should assume that liberal democracy is safe or healthy or will last forever. Uh, I think there's a particular tendency in England where we love to talk about being the mother of parliaments that we oh, invented democracy, which we didn't, and that we're best at it, and this is the way it is done. When actually, you know, the best best version is that our democracy is 100 years old, I think, because that's when we had basically a universal franchise. Um, that we could get onto children and prisoners uh, who also should be enfranchised, in my view. But the idea that, that it should just be preserved in aspect and that everything's going to be fine is is nonsense, in my view. We uh, we have to actually work out a way to run democracy, assuming that it has to be constantly invent reinvented if it is to survive. Bang on seven minutes. Thank you, Polly. Oh. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. I agree with everything that Polly's just said, so uh, I'm not sure this is going to be much of a bad thing, but we'll see how we get on. Uh, so I wanted to start off saying a little bit about uh, one of my favourite pieces of recent academic research, which is a study of spending on disaster relief programmes and disaster preparedness programmes. Um, <clears throat> and basically what this study finds is that spending on disaster preparedness is great. Uh, it uh, prevents damage in the first place, and every dollar that you spend, this is an American study, of dollars, every dollar that you spend is okay. worth about $15 in terms of what you save. But there's enormous underinvestment in disaster preparedness programs, and at least part of the reason for that is that voters don't um, reward at the ballot box politicians who spent on disaster preparedness, on activities that would prevent damage uh, occurring when there, are, when, when there are natural disasters. They do reward um, politicians who do big stuff after a disaster takes place. They reward disaster relief. But they don't reward disaster preparedness. <coughs> and it appears, therefore, that voters don't get what's in their long-term interests. Now, the traditional um, uh, lesson that we've drawn from this is that we should have less democracy, that we should insulate decision makers from, uh, from voters uh, so that they can get on with doing what's in our long-term interests. We should have more technocratic policy making. Um, <coughs> the trouble is that that generally doesn't work. Um, if you insulate policy makers from uh, voters from accountability, that tends to lead to corruption. Uh, it tends to mean that the decision makers are less likely to understand the lives of the people who are affected by their decisions. And if you exclude people from uh, influence over things that affect their lives, then that leads to alienation. Alienation makes people unhappy and it risks an explosion where I think people find some way of of having voice uh, in a way that uh, might be quite disruptive. A better solution is to enrich democracy, to engage people in decision making to the extent that they do have the space to see the big, dis big picture and make decisions that they will be happy with over the long term. Um, the 2016 Brexit referendum, I think, is also an example of a very bad process of decision making. And I say that without regard to the result. Um, 
even the chair of the Vote Leave campaign, Gisela Stewart, has said that that is a referendum that should never have taken place, uh, at least in the form that it did. A better process might have led to a different result, or it might have led to the same result, but uh, a much uh, smoother, less damaging process following that result in terms of uh, the implementation. Now, many people, again, have drawn the conclusion from the 2016 referendum that we should just never have another referendum. This is a refrain that we hear very, very commonly, um, that we should insulate decision-making from voters because voters don't understand their long-term interests. <coughs> again, I say that's wrong. Uh, we should deepen democracy rather than strangling democracy. Mm. And I think the 2016 referendum, part of the problem, a large part of the problem, was that actually it gave people very, very little real power in at least three ways. So firstly, it gave people no role in deciding what options should appear on the ballot paper. Those were just magicked out of thin air by <coughs> David Cameron. Secondly, um, it, during the process of the referendum itself, it did not empower people to make an informed uh, decision. Uh, because people were subjected to a torrent of misinformation during the campaign from both sides. Um, so it was very difficult for people to make a decision to find the information that they wanted from sources that they trusted and therefore to make a decision that they should, could be confident in. And then thirdly, people were asked to make a choice only on the principle of Brexit, not on the details. So all of the downstream stuff after the referendum, again, people have had very little influence over. <clears throat> a better referendum, a better way of, democracy, of doing democracy would involve deepening uh, people's ability to engage, people's opportunities to engage with the process at all of those stages. So at the upstream stage, working out what are the options that people are actually choosing among, uh, well, we need much, much more thought about that and engage people directly in that. Martin talked about citizens' assemblies, um, and citizens' assemblies are a fantastic way of engaging people in really thoughtful, serious discussion um, of what kinds of options we might want to choose among. Also, I should mention at this point, uh, traditional boring old parliamentary scrutiny is also a really important part of that process and didn't happen uh, in the case of the Brexit referendum. So using citizens' assemblies in order to explore options, consider the argu arguments, and make recommendations uh, would greatly enrich um, our democracy upstream. Um, in terms of decision moments in themselves, referendums and also elections, we could do a lot more to um, develop a rich, a rich ecosystem of quality, neutral or balanced information uh, that would allow people to make decisions that they can feel confident in. We're in the, in the beginnings of an election campaign just at the moment, and we have no official information that is readily available to voters on basic, basic stuff like who actually are your local candidates. I mean, if you re look really hard on, uh, on your local council's website, you will probably find that information. I mean, we're not quite there yet, but in a few weeks when the candidates have been announced. Um, but there is no ready information on, the, on that. Or who are these candidates? What, what, act, what have they done with their lives? What are their biographies? What are their histories? We have no ready source of information on that. Far less in a referendum campaign any kind of uh, information that we can really trust. So the report that Martin mentioned, our Doing Democracy Better report, explored various ways in which we could greatly enrich uh, the quality of information that's available during election and referendum campaigns. And then thirdly, in terms of downstream control uh, over uh, choice processes, if we do have to have a choice from time to time, a referendum from time to time about a matter of principle, a general question such as the Brexit question, then at the very least design the referendum process properly so that you have a, a double referendum process so that you have a second referendum built in before the start of the process, um, once the uh, details have been worked out so that people really can make a proper final choice. Thank you. Rosalind. Thanks very much. So the central issue of this debate, as I see it, is how democracy should move forward. 
and other than doing the same thing and hoping for different results, the options have basically boiled down between mass, individually oriented participation and small scale controlled participation. So the former, which I will be defending, leans towards the ideal of liberty, while the latter leans theoretically, if not practically, towards the ideal of equality. However, they're both important principles of democracy. So I'm going to briefly lay out my position here as to why I believe that sortition, as represented by citizens' assemblies, is a really bad idea, and mass digitally facilitated participation is a good one. So sortition, or selecting people to participate in citizens' assemblies, means selecting people to participate via lottery. And just like you don't have a meaningful chance of winning a lottery, you don't have a meaningful chance of being selected to participate in a citizens' assembly. There are approximately 50 million eligible voters in Great Britain. So even in an assembly of 500 people, which is larger and thus far more expensive than any option I've heard discussed in relation to the UK, each person would have to represent 100,000 other voters, which is 23,000 more than an MP represents on average. So one's chance of being selected to ever participate in one's lifetime is very low. Elections are flawed, and we can go into how they're flawed in the Q&A, because there's a lot of ways they're flawed. But they rest on the principle that each voter is entitled to cast an equal vote, and that each voter has the right to stand in an election. Yes, people have advantages and disadvantages, but the principle is law and equality. Sortition dispenses with that and creates a vast inequality between those who are selected to participate and those who are not. And that contravenes the fundamental principle of one person, one vote, equal political participation, and absolutely breaks the chain of legitimacy that exists between voters and government. And in those situations where some people just want to use citizens' assemblies to inform government, you basically haven't achieved anything because you haven't changed the balance of power. So from a legal and philosophical point of view, this already amounts to basically torching the Enlightenment. But also consider the practicalities. Politics is not just about determining where right lies. Perhaps much more importantly, it's about determining where might lies. 100 or 500 people might decide something however lovely, but how, pray tell, are they going to enforce that on the other 49,999,500 voters? Sorticianists say that voters must trust that an assembly would make the decisions voters would if those voters were as informed as the assembly. But quite apart from the incredibly patronizing attitude, consider that experts spend decades training and practicing full time. You can't download that information on someone over the course of a few weekends, as people who advocate citizens' assemblies want to do. And the relationship between your level of knowledge and an informed decision isn't directly proportional. It's more normal to go back and forth between different options than to move inexorably closer to the one right option. So cutting debate off at an arbitrary point isn't a good idea. Sorticianists are trying to section themselves off from a wider inclusive debate. They've decided they can't win in the real world against Rupert Murdoch, Fox News, etc. But political decisions have to be implemented in the real world by those real millions of people. So if you can't win in the real world, you can't win. Now, there's more things wrong with citizens' assemblies, but we'll get on to what I advocate, uh, which is digital participation. And this is how uh, democracy worked in ancient Athens. It was a mass participatory democracy. So power in Athens was with the people. That's what democracy means. It means people power. And they met and decided on things directly, usually five or 6,000 citizens at a time, which would be like 6 million people in the UK today. When they used sortition for administrative and judicial, which is different than legislative purposes, it also involved the equivalent of millions of people. The Athenians did not select people to participate carefully. They literally herded them to participate, although they did not whip them for not participating. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, so <laughs> it's, it's a good story, but they didn't. So, so you have to ask yourself, why? Like, why would you do that? The more people participate, the more work it is. And it was way more work back then than it is now. So why didn't they just pick a few people to participate via sortition or elections, when that would have been much easier for them to do? So the answer is that mass participation is the only way to significantly fight corruption and prevent rule by the few, which is a problem we have today. And that's why I advocate doing this digitally in modern large states, 
as is already being done by the Firestorm movement in Italy, Podemos in Spain, the pirate parties, for electoral voting in Estonia via participatory budgeting in Ireland, Russia, Iceland, Portugal, France, and in Taiwan. So when we see, when we do do participatory budgeting in online democracy, we also don't see people making short-term decisions. We actually do see people making those kind of long-term decisions um, and usually forgoing uh, vanity projects that politicians so love. So contrary to what a lot of people think when they hear the word digital, this is nothing like social media. Unlike social media, democracy is not a debating society. Democracy is just people making decisions and the tools we use reflect that structure. That translates into instant, unavoidable accountability and a clear record of what did and didn't work instead of eternally arguing over topics without gathering new information. Putting the decision-making process on blockchain already makes it technically unhackable, but the real security lies in the fact that there's little point to hacking decisions you can't lock in, and only natural persons can participate under one identity that stays with them forever. So unlike sortition, which wants to exclude people and invite lobby groups in as influencers, which is exactly what elections do as well, and which is the conduit along which all the money flows, digital democracy includes people and disadvantages non-natural entities that do not themselves possess the right to vote. So the digital era has unleashed a lot of potential political energy that's whipping around at a loose end. And rather than trying to suppress and contain that, we need to harness it constructively and make it work for us. And the only way to do that is to bind it into the decision-making chain. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Rosie. Jim. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, to a lot of what um, Rosalind has said, and, and I think I'm sympathetic to some of the concerns that, that um, the first two panellists have raised. Um, the, 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 the brief for this discussion asked one important question. Could Brexit and the wider debates about the future of Europe give us a chance to employ new methods and reimagine how democracy works. And, and I think we're all interested in the idea of reimagining how democracy works. Um, when I first started teaching politics about uh, 20 years ago, we were obsessed by the uh, political crisis that we, 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 we talked about in terms of apathy and disengagement. And I think I sat on a panel at this uh, event and other events talking about methods to engage more and more people in uh, the electoral process and in participatory structures. I think the problem for most uh, commentators, or many commentators, was that liberal democracy requires a certain level of mass popular engagement as a legitimizing function. People need to turn out to vote in order to demonstrate their consent to laws made in parliament and the government in power and the direction that that government wants to uh, take us in. Democracy is therefore a means towards achieving legitimacy for the state and for governments. And, and that's true, it is that. Um, the democratic crisis of, of 20 years ago was, was very definitely that popular disengagement established or, or represented and expressed a really quite profound legitimacy crisis in our institutions. Um, I don't think that legitimacy crisis has been uh, overcome, and indeed I think uh, Brexit has revealed just how profound that crisis continues to be. So what's at stake in the discussion now, is, as I read things, is the question of what we think democracy is or what we think it can be. Democratic engagement does serve uh, to provide legitimacy to governing institutions. The principle of popular sovereignty is the idea that the legitimacy of the state and those uh, who govern on our behalf is established through expressing the will of the people. The source of political power is therefore the people or the citizens. But for this to have real meaning, and, and, and this is where we need to start being a bit more creative, um, I agree, for this to have real meaning, we need to recognize that it's more than simply it's more, it requires more than people simply informing uh, the decisions of people who sit uh, in Parliament. Elections and referendums are not simply opinion polls. Democracy is a process whereby citizens have and need to have the power to make collective decisions about how they want to live and what laws they're willing to be uh, bound by. And therefore, democracy is about popular control holding power to account, having power over the way in which uh, society moves. I think the crisis that we have at the moment is very clearly expressed in the existence of a parliament of, uh, which contains a majority of MPs who don't particularly and, and never did particularly want to leave the European Union. And then by contrast, an as yet unfilled mandate from people in a referendum to leave the European Union. That crisis, I think, expresses uh, a conflict between two very different understandings of, of, of what those people in Parliament and what we think, uh, or what we might think, uh, uh, democracy is all about. On one model, the opinions of the people should, from time to time, be taken into account in order to inform uh, a kind of 
uh, 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 specialised decision making. And on the other, majorities, uh, majorities of people actually have to have a level of control over the decisions that are taken. And the second model is much, much uh, messier, much more uh, unpredictable. Um, I suspect very often it, it cannot lead us to consensus because there are lots and lots of uh, decisions that need to be made which are about fundamental conflicts of interest and in that sense they cannot be made uh, by consensus although certainly the more we can agree on things the, the better and more effectively and more efficiently we will get things done. But I think something like the Brexit referendum is a clear example where, where there is an option to leave and there is an option to remain. I mean, there isn't much consensus that one can achieve on that kind of decision. And insofar as we think that is a decision that we should make, uh, it has to go one way or another way. And therefore, it has to go with, 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 with the majority uh, decision. Um, because the, the alternative to that is that we go with um, the minority decision, isn't it? The alternative to that is that we, we, we don't accept what a majority has uh, voted for, and instead we go with things uh, that uh, a minority, uh, likely a more informed minority, uh, can do on our behalf. And I think that's deeply uh, problematic. So, I mean, I, I think in, in terms of what this means we could do, I think there are a number of very uh, important things that we need to do in order to start taking uh, democracy in Britain seriously, one of which is, is, is to enact Brexit. That's straightforward to me. Uh, a significant majority of people voted to leave the European Union. The fact that we haven't is, is, is deeply, uh, deeply problematic. Um, I, I think there is also a level at which we need to significantly reform the institutions of representative democracy. I don't think I'm quite as uh, quick to want to give up on those representative institutions as, as maybe Rosalind is, but maybe we can, we can argue some of this out. So, I mean, certainly we need electoral reform. The fact that we have um, a, a means of electing governments which um, <coughs> results in kind of peculiar... Uh, mostly two-party dominated politics where those two parties are, are incredibly weird coalitions of, of, of different views is, is problematic. The fact that we have a, a parliament in 2015 elected where uh, UKIP get 12% of the vote and one seat and the Greens get 3.8% of the vote and one seat expresses the extent to which you've got two really important constituencies who are not getting anything like uh, a level of, 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 of proportional representation. I think, for me, the reason for having a far more proportional electoral system isn't because I think that will necessarily give us a more consensual politics. I think it's because it would actually reveal some of the, the social divides that exist within society between people in different positions. And it's only once we start to reveal and represent those divides and divisions within our representative institutions that we can actually start working out where we want to go with them, uh, which of those divisions mean what, and how we move forward. Um, I think on the subject of Parliament... Um, this, this, I'm sure, is, is, is a controversial view. Um, I, I think um, it, it is peculiar and, and problematic that we still have a House of Lords, which is an entirely undemocratic uh, institution. It remains unelected more than 20 years after New Labour first proposed to radically shape it up. Um, and I think, um, it, 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 if I'm not being overly simplistic, I, I think I would like to see us just get rid of it. I think rather than have uh, a second chamber whose job is to, uh, to revise... Uh, to amend, to transform legislation, to improve it, I, I would like a, 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 a single uh, representative chamber within which we might expect uh, our elected representatives to do a better job of coming up with that uh, policy and proposal and legislation uh, in the first place. I think there's a number of other things like that that, that I would want us to very seriously consider in terms of giving people more uh, possibility of having accounted rep uh, representatives who can be held to account. And I think, um, in spite of Alan's concerns about uh, referendums, I think the only way in which we could make any of those decisions, in my view, as, as real democratic decisions, is by opening them up to referendums. So I think I would want more and more and more opportunities for people to engage in making decisions which are binding. I'm sure there is uh, very definitely a role for a process of um, informed, considered discussion and deliberation about exactly what question we should ask in which circumstance. I, I, I have no concerns about that whatsoever. But I think we need to draw a distinction between the idea of processes which might inform uh, politicians and representatives who will make decisions on our behalf and the idea of people actually being able to make those decisions and take those decisions on the basis of, of what they think and what, we feel, what they feel. And I'm concerned about the idea... Um, I, I'm concerned about the extent to which at the moment we seem to be very concerned about the fact that people just don't know enough, just don't have enough information, just aren't going to make the right kinds of decisions. Because the only thing I can read from that is that actually we, we kind of wish they, they weren't 
in a position to make those binding decisions because if only we could tell them better, they would make better decisions. And, and that's my concern behind this discussion. Okay. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, <laughs> thanks to everybody. Okay, uh, we are going to take a little clutch of questions and comments at a time. Uh, we're being uh, filmed and recorded, so do please wait for the microphones. Uh, what I'm going to do is taking little sort of geographically based clusters to make it easy for the microphone wallers to get around you. So let's start with uh, this gentleman over here to start with, then you, then you. This one here, the front, please, sorry. If you can, uh, do you want us, them to stand up when they're, no, no need. Okay. Uh, first of all, a general question to the whole panel. Australia has a system where everybody has to vote by law and if you don't, you'll get prosecuted. Mm. What is your comment on that? And the second question is, Switzerland has a lot of referenda. Is that a good idea or not? Um, coming back to your position on reforming parliament, should we not have two houses, one the House of Commons as it is now, and reform the House of Lords? It becomes a representative, uh, proportional representative. So. You had two houses, as in America, uh, where they can actually decide on things. And last thing, on your point of referendum, the Brexit vote, I think Cameron actually thought he was going to win, so he didn't think of the consequences of losing, and I don't think anybody else did, and that's where the problem has come in now. Sure. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, this question is for Rosalind. How would you ensure this direct digital democracy against non-compliance or corrupt institutional meddling? So, for example, if the government of this country is willing to kick the can of Brexit down the road for three and a half years, what's to say that they'll act any differently if the result of that referendum is being sent to them electronically or on a slip of yeah. paper? Okay. Thanks very much. <clears throat> I'm reminded of a comment made by the novelist Tim Parks that representative democracy is a contradiction in terms because the tiny minority of people who are willing to stand for public office are by definition unrepresentative of the vast majority who are not. And I would suggest that the, the, what we need is a parliament filmed with people who don't want to be there. <laughs> And then perhaps we can get I think we've got that at the moment, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. They did volunteer in the first place. Now, if we had a system, as in Athens, where our <laughs> leaders were chosen by lot rather than by vote, we would then have to address the question of how do we hold them to account? And that's perhaps where digital democracy could come in. But I like the idea of a parliament chosen by lot, because by definition, you'd have proper representation of women, ethnic minorities, etc., uh, which we don't at the moment. Um, uh, and we would have far fewer old Etonians as well, which I think would be an improvement. <laughs> okay, thank you. Right, we've got a few nice ones there. We've got a couple of questions whether compulsory voting, as in Australia, is a good idea, what we think of the multiple referenda in Switzerland, uh, whether there's still a role for a bicameral uh, representative system with a, a second house um, exposing the first to scrutiny uh, and the um, representative democracy in a sort of platonic um, sense of people not choosing, people being uh, forced to uh, take part in that. And then we have one question specifically for Rosalind. So let's start off with you, Rosalind, about the how do you deal with um, enforcing the uh, decisions of direct democracy with an uncooperative government? Okay, well, I guess the, the point is that there is no government in our you know, and under our model. So when we say people power, we mean things do come from the people. So we see like a transition state to that, you know, participatory budgeting is one thing we can do. People agreeing to do what their constituents tell them to do is another thing. So there are actually quite a lot of people who run on the platform of saying we will do what our uh, constituents tell us to do. For example, some people in Iceland do that. Uh, some people in, you know, the Five Star Movement and Podemos do that to some extent. So in the long term, there is no government. So that's why it's not a problem. Um, no, it's not anarchy at all. I mean, this was a system that existed for several hundred years, and it definitely was not an anarchy. It was one of the most successful 
systems probably ever, actually. So it was by no means an, an anarchy. Democracy is a system where people have power, but that is not, like, anarchy would mean that there is no power. Okay, all. do you want to uh, pick up on okay. some of the so other, the other ones? Yeah. any okay. of the other points? Don't feel you need to address them all. Okay, um, no, I, I won't do the ones that were more towards some of the other people. Mm. So, um, yeah, representative democracy being a contradiction in terms, yes, it, it is. And in fact, you know, if you go back and read the Founding Fathers, for example, they would have said, we're trying to create a republic. We are not trying to create a democracy. And they were very, very clear on that. They didn't want to create a democracy. They knew what a democracy was. And that's why we started using the term representative democracy and democracy generally more often about 70 or 80 years ago. And that is why it's a contradiction in terms, because electoral elections pretty much are a form of oligarchy really and that is how most ancient writers would have seen them as a form of oligarchy because you choose a small number of people um, and that kind of leads into the other question which is having um, people chosen by lottery to be in parliament as in Athens it's not how they did things in Athens in Athens people generally anyone participated on a voluntary um, basis they didn't choose people by lot to make decisions for them, they use that for other functions. Um, but the problem is that if you have small numbers of people making decisions, right, very small numbers of people compared to the total population of your country, which means very small numbers of people compared to the total resources available in the country, then you will always end up with corruption because you're reducing decision making to an overviewable level of variables. It's very easy to put pressure on that small amount of people. So it doesn't matter if you choose them by lot or by election, as long as it's always such a small amount of people, they're easy to manipulate. Jim, do you want to pick up on one or two points? Um, I, I mean, let me just talk to the compulsory voting issue. I, I, I've never been convinced by the arguments for compulsory voting, although I think voting and, and taking part in the democratic process is hugely important. And I suppose the reason that I'm not convinced by the idea of compulsory voting is because I think taking part in the democratic process is, is so very important. And therefore, I think we need to recognise uh, the importance and the capacity of individuals to take part. If we really want people to have the power and control to determine how society should function, we've really got to trust them with the capacity to make some really important decisions and to take that decision making seriously. So if we're not then willing to trust them to make the decision of whether or not they want to vote, I think we're kind of fundamentally undermining uh, that whole account of what we think uh, a citizen is, what we think a potential voter is. I, I mean, I think that that for me relates to the question that, 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 that was raised at the beginning, the idea of enfranchising uh, prisoners or of, of children's vote or of lowering the voting age and things like that. I, I think we have a lot of discussion about, at the moment about the need to expand the number of people who can vote without thinking about what we really mean uh, or, or what, what we think the individual's process of voting is. Um, I work with uh, prisoners uh, quite a lot. I, I do lots of teaching in prisons through the Open University. Um, I'm, I'm kind of of the belief that a huge number of them probably shouldn't be there. So I'm, I'm, I in no sense want to disadvantage prisoners any more than they are already disadvantaged. But I think my understanding of what it is to be an engaged citizen who can make political decisions is someone who has a level of autonomy, a capacity to go out and find out what's going on in the world, a capacity to go out and argue and debate with people. And the prisoners that I have can't do that. Right? Very often I turn up to teach them and they're not there because they're in lockdown in their cells. They can't access resources that I need them to look at on the internet because they have no access to the internet. So the fundamental capacity of being an informed citizen and being able to engage in discussions and hold power to account I think is something that has been denied to prisoners. So in saying we should enfranchise prisoners, I think we're actually potentially undermining what we think the vote and the significance of democratic participation is. Thanks. Alan. Um, so, in responding to various of these, these questions, I think it's useful just to bear in mind <clears throat> kind of what are the basic principles of democracy that we're trying to pursue here. And I think we're, we're, we're all agreed on <clears throat> equality of participation, the possibility for everyone to take part on equal terms. <clears throat> I think we um, are diverging a bit on the degree to which it's also important that people should have the opportunity to make decisions having had the chance to think about it and, 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 and learn about the options. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, it seems to me that it, it is really, really vital that we should, we should be able to make decisions that we, we are confident in and that we will have a reasonable chance of being happy with uh, months or years uh, down the line. So it's not remotely patronising to say that it's important to be informed in making decisions. Uh, it's about ensuring that we, are, we all of us, <laughs> equally, <laughs> Uh, uh, can take part in decision making um, and I think in order to get that uh, it, 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 it takes time 
uh, it takes a, a, a lengthy process, a, a process where we can all get involved uh, at multiple stages. So there was a question on uh, referendums in Switzerland, uh, and there are lots of referendums in Switzerland, and that works very well. Um, there is absolutely no evidence that there's, there's a problem with, how, with the, having more referendums. But it's really important to understand how the Swiss system works. And it's not just like they have lots of referendums from time to time and, and pe people suddenly are confronted with a question on the ballot paper that there hasn't previously been debate, debate about. Those referendums have gone through all sorts of really detailed scrutiny um, before you get to the referendum stage. And in the Swiss model of doing this, which is quite old, that scrutiny takes place mainly in Parliament among elected representatives. In a better model of that, I think it would take place among regular citizens as well, uh, uh, working in citizens' assemblies. Um, the, you, you also asked about bicameralism. Similarly, bicameralism is a way of ensuring that there are multiple steps along the way, multiple opportunities to think about it before we get to a decision. And I see no evidence that uh, it is uh, easy to combine both the kind of political accountability that first chambers tend to offer, offer and the sort of detailed scrutiny uh, and quite technical scrutiny often that a second chamber such as the House of Lords um, provides. I'm not suggesting the House of Lords is anything like ideal in its current form, but a body that is capable of doing detailed, thoughtful scrutiny, is, I think, is a really important part of the process. If you, if you don't have these kinds of, uh, of processes, um, then either you have decision-making that is not well-informed, and we're likely to do the kind of thing that I talked about at the start in terms of disaster relief and disaster preparedness, or you end up with a process where actually there's only a few people who engage really deeply. Um, and, 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 and the great bulk of people don't. Um, and then you lose on the inclusiveness side. So my concern about a model such as uh, Rosalind's model of, of digital democracy is if you're expecting people to, or, 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 or you're, you're setting up a process that involves really thinking through questions in detail before making a final decision, then that could be great, but not many people are going to do it. And the people who do it are not going to be representative of the wider population. So you end up not having an inclusive process. Okay. Or you don't have that, that kind of detail, <coughs> in which case um, you're losing on the in informed side of the, mm. the argument. Polly. Um, it, it just feels a bit like we're having an argument between DIY enthusiasts about what the best tool is. And, like, it's a hammer. No, it's a chisel. No, it's got to be a screwdriver. And obviously you need all of them. And so a democracy is a thing that is full of decisions of all sorts, some of which are binary and uh, exclusive, you know, should, should it be, I don't know, legal or illegal to um, have an abortion or, you know, but then you then come into, okay, well, what should the boundary be and what should the exclusions be? And then you also get, you know, there's endless decisions about, you know, where exactly are we going to build the houses in my village? And then there is exactly what play equipment do we need in the playground? And then you've got which train line should we build? And actually, should it curve around Sheffield or should it go around uh, uh, so that it can um, go to the stop at the shopping centre? You know, democracy is just filled with decisions. And, and the idea that you can answer absolutely every single one of those with... Um, uh, some of the amazing stuff that they have done in, in Taiwan or Iceland around digital democracy is not the answer to all of these problems. A, a representative democracy is brilliant at doing some other stuff. Um, and actually, you know, just a community forums of everybody getting together in the local park, friends of local parks groups are really valuable. Um, I, I just, I, I think we have to accept, being a citizen is hard work and if there is going to be a kind of labour surplus as we automate everything and we've all got suddenly only three days of paid work to do, well, I'd like to see the, the rest of our spare time going into um, civic participation and decision-making of some kind, but recognising that it's, it, it's both different decisions and different people want and need to engage in different ways. 
you know, there's an efficiency thing here. Actually, lots of, the re lots of people don't think much about politics because they're very happy to outsource that, just as I am very happy to outsource repainting my living room to somebody who's better at that than me. And it's perfectly reasonable and rational to want to outsource some of our political decision-making to some other people via a process of democratic accountability or simply saying, actually, I want some technocrats to be in charge of that. Who do I want deciding the inflation rate? Do you know what? Mark Carney looks like a good egg. Fine. That's OK. Um, and, and the idea that everybody should always be participating in every single decision is simply wrong. But we have to find ways, whether it's engaging in your park or your hospital or your school or decisions about the legal framework or being part of the justice system, that everybody has civic responsibilities to participate. And I would mandate them to vote. And I would extend the vote to children of the age of 10 because they're criminally responsible. Uh, if they're responsible enough to be able to understand uh, the law so as not to break it, and we'll punish them if they do, then they should be responsible for helping to shape the law too. OK. Thanks, Polly. No. Right, I'm going to take a, a cluster from... they can help from, make the laws about whether they I'm drink going to take a, let, Let's keep the conversation when it's mic'd up so we can all hear. Let's take a cluster leading from the back. There's, um, actually, let's start here because the gentleman's had his hand up um, most of the session. And then the person on the same row and then the one behind, please. We'll take three at a time. Yeah, um, thank you all very much. Um, my question is particularly for Ms. McKenzie, but uh, for all the panel, and based on the comment Mr. Rennick and others made about um, lack of accountability uh, lead, will lead to corruption and technocrats, not a good idea to let them run the show. I worked in the Ukraine with the somewhat surprisingly, the successor agency to the KGB for a European Union program. And I saw the horrendous misgovernment and uh, corruption in the European Union program because of the lack of accountability. Uh, you might find that a bit strange. Um, so my question for Ms. McKenzie, but also for the rest is, did you in your time working for Mr. Nick Clegg ever hear that gentleman or his wife, who is also a former European Commission official, ever express any doubt about a democratic deficit and lack of accountability and therefore risk or actual corruption in his time there or not. Okay. Because I saw it, plenty of yeah. others saw it. Okay, thank you. The two behind you. Um, sorry, yes, me first. Yeah. Um, yes, thanks very much to everyone. I think it's an excellent question that we should all be considering. Um, and I f I'm wondering what I'm missing in some ways um, because um, I was privileged to join my first trade union in the early 80s. And so I experienced what I felt to be an extremely democratic system where we had workplace um, branches. And from that, we elected representatives to um, the committee that would negotiate with the employer, but also um, representatives to represent us at the regional level. So we knew those people, we knew their records, they were totally accountable to us. Then the region would discuss things and they would elect representatives to the national executive um, and then they would um, uh, um, elect, um, yeah. sorry, it was national council and then national executive. So, so it was a structure. But at the branch level, if we were fed up with how our regional representative was rep was was carrying out their job, we could pull them back, even if they had reached the higher echelons. Um, so that's accountability, and it's finding a way where, yes, I totally agree, one person, one vote is crucial. Splitting us up into little groups and making sure we're all properly representative is divisive and not helpful. It's one person, one vote. It's, in, it's including everybody as much yep. as possible without forcing them, and then it's accountability for those decisions. Okay, thanks very much. And the one behind... Yes, thank you. Um, people have talked about on the panel all sorts of areas which have democratic deficits, and I just wanted to focus on the issue of, of government power 
uh, we elect a government, it has power, and there are aspects of that power which are very undemocratic. Uh, for example, the royal prerogative power, which is used to make treaties and war making, um, that does have very little accountability to Parliament or us when it's used. And yet, the attack on government power, which has actually suddenly reared its head over Brexit, and I'm talking about the Supreme Court, who've ruled on the process of how the government should exercise its power to, to Brexit, rather than Parliament or us, or the fact that the Speaker and the opposition allowed, uh, were allowed to seize the order paper from the government, which is a government power, to dictate how the government negotiates with a foreign power, the EU, uh, seems really bad as well. Uh, we need a government we elect, and we need it to have power, but uh, not power that's unaccountable. So I would suggest, surely we need a republic. Uh, you know, let, let's argue for that, because then we can have government powers that are accountable, but not dictated to by Congress and Assembly or Parliament. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to go uh, along the panel, starting with colleagues with a specific question to her. I think if we can keep our comments fairly brief, and also if you keep your comments from the audience fairly brief, just so we've got a lot of hands, I want to get as many uh, uh, talking as possible. Polly. Uh, well, so, I mean, it's, uh, I can't uh, recount every word that Nick Clegg has ever said, because I think it would bore everybody. Uh, but he, he has and did write extensively on the faults of the European Union. It's full of faults. Um, Personally, I think it exists and we're better off as part of it than we are out of it. That doesn't make it perfect. Uh, and um, he's written pamphlets on it, I think, with chart, uh, at the Centre for European Reform, if you really want to look them up. Uh, and Miriam would say the same. Um, I, I totally think the power of recall is really, really important when you have representatives. Uh, we have a pretty paltry power of recall that, uh, that I was help, part of helping introduce. And I think it helps to slowly build momentum to say, actually, you should be able to, to bring people back. Um, and uh, yes, let's have a republic. Let's get rid of the Queen. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I, um, I very much agree that accountability, two of the questions there have focused on accountability, and I think that is absolutely fundamental. I think um, whether you have a monarch or not uh, it isn't a question that I get very excited about, but I would certainly constrain the prerogative powers. I think the idea that we still have some powers that hand, reside in the hands of the executive by virtue, ultimately, of the idea that the monarch is a source of legitimacy uh, makes no sense in a modern democracy in which, as James said, um, the electorate are the only source of legitimacy. Um, uh, accountability is also fun fundamental uh, if we're thinking about deliberative dem dem democracy processes. So, I mean, I agree with those who've uh, said that citizens' assemblies shouldn't have ultimate decision-making power for that reason, uh, because there is no accountability mechanism there. Um, I think that doesn't mean they're not really important and really valuable um, processes, as, as Polly's kind of suggested, processes of decision making are very complex and involve multiple bits and pieces and there are all sorts of influences going through the system and uh, the influence that deliberative processes can exercise can be really important even if they're not uh, finally decision making. Mm. Okay. Yeah, okay, there, there wasn't a lot on those questions really, but I'd like to respond to some of the other points uh, mm. that yeah. were raised. Yeah. Um, so, one thing, some things that were said is that people are happy to outsource uh, their decision-making power to other people. They don't seem too happy to be doing that to me lately. Um, if people want to, that's fine. You just don't have to vote. I mean, we have quite a few referenda in Ireland as well as they do in Switzerland. Sometimes I just don't vote in those referendums if I don't have a strong opinion on the topic. So you're free to you know, decide what the strength is of your opinion or to be neutral on that opinion as well. I think that is a better way to measure feeling or sentiment or measure what people want to do than to say we're going to pick you know, people, some of them we're going to make sure that 50% of them are women and so on and so forth. Um, because you're now picking people who wouldn't necessarily choose to participate or don't necessarily have a strong opinion on it to the detriment of people who do and who would like to participate. So as I said, decisions have to be implemented. It doesn't matter how good the decision is, you have to implement that decision. And that's why when we're actually voting, we actually have the saying, ballots, not bullets. Well, why do we have that saying? Most people don't think about it. It's because you're, kind of, you're contesting where the force lies in your society. And if people don't do that peacefully by voting, either directly or for representatives, they tend to have a civil war. 
So we're not just measuring trying to get to right answers. We're also measuring where the sentiment is in society and what you're going to be able to do. Sometimes you choose the second best thing. If people are really on board with it, they'll be more successful than if they had chosen the technically best thing because they're behind it and they'll work towards it. Um, I, I mean, I really agree with the, um, the kind of Republican idea, the, the uh, abolition, I would say, of the royal prerogative, and, and, and with that, the monarch, I, I would uh, uh, go with uh, straight away. I, I think the other issue that that, that question raised was, was the, the, the question of, I, I guess, what is the, the increasing juridification of um, politics and political decision-making, the increasing role that courts play um, and that other institutions play in, uh, I, I would say, controlling uh, the, the powers that, that Parliament has. And I think that's deeply, deeply problematic because it, it suggests that we want to have a level of technical uh, expert control over the capacity that Parliament has uh, to make binding decisions and therefore ultimately over the capacity that we have uh, to make decisions about what we want society to look like. And I think that's really, really problematic. I think it's based upon the idea that we can't really trust the parliamentarians to do their job properly. By implication, we can't really trust uh, the people to make the right kind of decisions. As Matthew Paris said in announcing his conversion, uh, beware of the mob, which I think really means beware of, beware of people, beware of uh, most people, beware of everyday people who are not uh, intelligent like me. Um, I just, I mean, one thing, just on, on this idea, because I think we're not talking about, you, you know, the issue of the franchise franchise and voting is that, but, but that is one of the reforms that's, that's proposed to enliven democracy. I'm really troubled, Polly, by the idea of um, extending the vote to, to 10 year olds. I'm, I'm very fond of 10 year olds. My nine year olds will be 10 in a couple of months and, and, and obviously they're incredibly intelligent and, and we are currently engaging in really fascinating discussions about where to go on holiday and who should be Prime Minister and Brexit and, and what they want to have for their birthday party. But they are not... But no, no, I, but I mean, I'm saying that these are the discussions that I'm having because I take uh, parenting seriously, but, but they are not uh, in any sense my equals or, or any of your equals in the capacity to make important, informed decisions. So insofar as we think that's what a citizen has to do, I, I don't know what a democracy would be when children have the vote. I, I just don't know what we're imagining decision-making to be when at the one hand we're saying it's about making informed decisions and on the other hand we're saying just as 10-year-olds could do. The reason I don't think my children can make informed decisions is because I spend so much time trying to educate them in the decisions that they make and then when, we make, when they make terrible decisions I overrule them. So I can only imagine that a demos uh, that, that has 10-year-olds in it would have to have somebody like me in charge to inform the decisions that everyone was making and then when we make the wrong decisions to overrule them. It's, it's really a, a kind of infantilization of what the citizens are, yeah, literally. Let, let Polly come back. Um, um, I'd, I'd like to be clear, I'm not proposing that only 10 year olds should vote and I, I don't foresee, I, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen a demographic model in which 10 year olds become a majority. Uh, we use age so often as a proxy for a whole set of indicators. We say that as soon as you're 65, you must therefore be in desperate poverty and be in need of a free TV license and a free bus pass. We use age as a proxy for uh, engagement and intellect, and I think that that is odd. And I'd be very happy to settle for 14 if we also raise the age of criminal responsibility to 14. But it seems to me that that's, for me, that, that, that's a reasonable switching point. When you say that you are required to abide by the law, you have to have deep enough understanding of the law that if you break it, we will punish you, that that might be a, a point at which you might therefore be part of making those laws as part of a demos which includes a huge number of people who are older than you and also probably a whole number of people who are stupider than you. We do not give out the franchise by asking people to fill out a test proving that they are clever, thoughtful and are going to take it seriously. We okay. don't do that. And so why do we use age as a proxy for seriousness? Okay, thanks very much. Right, we've got... Uh I'm going to go over this side now. We've got three uh, to your right there, person with the mic, two hands right in front of you there, and then the lady in the middle. Yep. Right from the outset, there's been a presupposition from at least two of the speakers that referenda are a bad idea. The uh, reason is because I think they dislike the result of the recent one on Brexit, which had a huge turnout. A turnout particularly strong from those people from whom we never hear. The uh, uh, 
the, the people who live in safe seats, whose votes are generally taken for granted on parliamentary uh, elections. They've mentioned that there weren't sufficient plans for leave. But there were. They just weren't particularly sponsored by a government that was in favour of Remain. Um, <clears throat> Mr Rennick claimed that the question, that is the question, leave or remain, was magicked out of thin air. Those were your words. It really wasn't. Those people like myself who were campaigning for this rec referendum for decades actually lobbied quite hard to secure an objective question that didn't lead to an inadvertent bias in favour of either the uh, status quo or in favour of uh, leaving the EU. No, I think your, your concerns about referenda are because you don't like the results of the recent one. And yet, referenda have been transformative in many cases. Uh, the third speaker mentioned the recent cases in Ireland. They have been transformative in breaking the religious and parliamentary deadlock on questions of uh, personal rights. And in Northern Ireland, of course, they cemented the peace accords. We have had successful referenda on things like the North East Assembly, alternative voting, the creation of the Scottish Parliament, the first Scottish Indy referendum, and the creation of moralities around the country. But those haven't reached objection. The one that's, reached, uh, with, that's achieved an objection from academics has been the one that their side lost because, ultimately, the European Union always loses referenda. <laughs> okay. No, to you first. Yep. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that, and I'm glad that James has come back on quite a few things. I just wanted to say that um, I don't really understand this thing about having to have a second house because to, to look out to proper parliamentary scrutiny and all this, because I thought, that's why we have you know, committees and advisors and scientists who get, you know, brought on to advise MPs and things like that. I thought that was their job. I don't see why you would want to have a second house when we have, we have got experts already, we have got advisors. And I get, I get so tired. I read an article by Jonathan Sumption this morning, in the, actually it's an old one, about how, how the referendum was a mistake because people know so much more about how we have to have a second referendum. People know so much more about the Brexit now we've had, you know, four years. And I think... This thing about people haven't been informed. People were less informed when they actually got the franchise in 1832. They didn't have the internet then, but they, were, you know, they had a moral compass. You do not need a university education to have a moral compass. This was a simple question about sovereignty and democracy. And I, I get so annoyed with the idea that you, that, that, that you shouldn't, you can't trust citizens to be informed about something like that. I, <laughs> okay, thank you. And then. I just wanted to ask uh, the panel what they thought about um, the, uh, the development that's happened across the country, largely in the West Country, where, where um, s s s the peop people have taken over their towns uh, in local elections as groups of indies. It's, sp it's spread out and it's quite an interesting phenomenon because the indie takeover is, is powered by um, a, really, a really big... Uh, disaffection with political parties, in particular the main political parties. And it's been going for some years now in some parts of the country whereby um, the independent takeover, complete takeover of town councils has resulted in uh, extraordinary uh, things getting done. Uh, it's as if it's an exposure of the tribal party political um, infighting that that, that does the opposite of getting things done. And so I just wanted to kind of ask people what they thought about that model, because the model is actually based on diversity of outlook. It's, it's, it's groups of people who care about their neighbourhoods getting together and leaving their big picture ideologies at the door and finding instantly that they can, they can really get stuff done. And it's a, it's a fascinating model to me, and I think that it does drop into this discussion just a little bit. Okay. Thanks. Right. We got uh, three points. One on um, referenda. I'm not sure the panel would agree with the, the premise of your question, actually, but it'd be interesting to see. Um, one on this whole idea of uh, people not being informed. I think that's particularly one directed at you, Alan. Um, and the, uh, the rise of the independence, the, the you know, surprising rise of the independence in, in local politics and increasingly national politics. So let's whiz along from Jim on any of those you want to pick up on, Jim. Um, are we finishing? Are we? No, is this, no, this no we've got some more to come. Um, I, I just, um, uh, 
I, 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 I think, I, I mean, I just kind of want to um, go back to the idea of, of, of the Lords in the Second Chamber. There's, there's, there's been a long discussion about, uh, or, or a long presumption of the need for a Second Chamber, which I think is, is based upon an idea that what we do is we have one chamber which, which makes laws, and then because we can't trust that chamber to make good laws, we actually need to refer things on to a. Uh, we actually need to refer things on to a second chamber. I mean, your model of the Senate, sir, that idea of a body of wise men who will take those laws, which are probably quite bad laws, and turn them into good, uh, wiser, and, and more inspired processes through this process of, of of reform and revising. And I think that's deeply problematic because constantly what we're talking about is splitting up, breaking down decisions that are accountable to the people into different component parts and making those decisions less accountable. And, and that, I think, is why, uh, uh, while I recognise the need for good laws, I would very much uh, uh, you know, want to propose the idea that actually one chamber that works well, which has revising capacities within it, which has scrutiny capacities within it, which actually work, would be a far more ideal situation in terms of enabling us to hold politics to account and, and a chamber to actually make political decisions. Yeah, okay, so picking up on the idea about the, the independence, yeah, I think an issue is that people complain a lot about polarization today, but actually population hasn't become much more polarized, it's actually political parties that have become a lot more polarized and a lot more well sorted. And the problem with that means that people used to join political parties in their area usually like to get ahead or because they're interested in local politics. Um, now when you join, you have to much more sign up to a very rigorous program uh, of what you want. And that puts a lot of people off joining, obviously. Um, another issue is that when you vote, and this is a problem with elections, when you vote, when you cast a vote for the Conservatives or Labour, you are not casting a vote that says you agree 100% with every single policy that they have or that they will have. So the problem is that when people vote, we don't know what they mean by that vote. Like, we don't know what a vote in favour of a party means. It could mean anything at all. It could just mean that you like your local representative. Um, so independents are able to be a lot more responsive, I think, you know, rather than that idea of you have to sign up lock, stock, and barrel to this platform, which may or may not be implemented in the end. You can run on a program where you'd be much more flexible in what you do and much more interactive. And I know that Independence for Froom, for example, um, is really interesting at some, uh, some people I've been in connection with for a long time, and they're a lot more able to just respond to what people want on the ground rather than having to kind of put down their party policy from above. Yeah. Um, uh, so two of those questions were, um, <laughs> I think, mainly directed to me. Uh, though um, I, I, all sorts of views were being attributed to me that I certainly don't hold. Uh, so I, I explicitly said that, um, uh, that I was arguing against the view that we shouldn't have any more referendums. Uh, I think that is an incorrect view. Uh, I certainly never said that you can't trust people, that you can't trust voters. Um, uh, I, 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 mean, I, I was arguing that we want to deepen democracy, trust voters more. Um, I certainly never said uh, that people are not capable of making uh, decisions for themselves. Um, but I think um, in a complex democratic environment, uh, different people are entitled to make choices in their own ways. And if for some people the referendum in 2016 was a simple matter of sovereignty and, uh, and that's all there was to it, then that's great. You're perfectly entitled to make a decision on that basis. But for other people, that's not what that choice was about. For some people, the choice between leaving or remaining was a very difficult choice. Uh, where trying to understand what the implications of the different options uh, was something that they really wanted to do before they made their minds up. They're perfectly entitled to choose in that way, if that's how they want to choose. But currently, as things are structured, it's very difficult for people to uh, work out how they want to make that kind of choice. And it's very difficult for people who do want to uh, explore matters in depth to find the information um, that would allow them to make a choice that they feel confident in. That we, um, uh, so, so <clears throat> I mean, it just seems to me that we need to respect all voters um, and, 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 and suggesting that somehow uh, the, these choices are very, very simple is maybe taking your perspective, um, but isn't understanding the diversity of perspectives 
across society as a whole. So if we're really going to engage in collective decision making, we have to have conversations with each other um, in which we understand this kind of complexity. And referendums that are rooted in that kind of conversation are the sorts of decision making processes that I'm suggesting would be desirable. Bully. I think the AV referendum is an interesting counterexample to, to the Brexit referendum, even though I, I was on the losing side of both of those. Um, I'm good, really good at losing. Um, it, is that it was a post legislative referendum, as in the legislation had already been done, and if the voters had chosen to change the electoral system, it would have happened because the legislation was already in place. And one of the challenges with the Brexit referendum is that it wasn't binding in the same way. It was an advisory referendum. Uh, and one of the reasons that it was an advisory referendum um, is because the you couldn't have passed the legislation because it's complicated and there are a range of different ways through which you can leave the European Union. And I agree that we should leave the European Union because we have to find a way to fulfil that democratic mandate. I was happy with Theresa May's deal. Boris Johnson's is worse, but I'm happy with that too because, you know, um, it, the, you, I, it's a good test for me, I think. Do you actually know very specifically in terms that a lawyer could, set, could interpret for legislation what it is that people are being asked to decide. If you can, and therefore you can have a post-legislative referendum, it seems to me that having a referendum is quite a good idea. Um, if you can't, then it, it, it is much more problematic and you end up with, with, with years and years of questions about how you interpret that mandate, uh, which are problematic. I, I think... The idea which Alan or um, you know, Dan Hannan, various other people, John Redwood, I think, had said, which is that you can have a first referendum, which is to sort of start a process, and then a confirmatory referendum, once you've got actually asking people to authorise genuine legislation, would have been better. Uh, and I think that that's a good test for future referendums, which I'm very happy with there being uh, many, many more of. And you're shaking your head at me. Hang on, we, we, we have to have the conversation to the mic, so just finish off, Polly, then, then I'm going to take some more questions. Um, but, well, if... It, it, well, I just I think yeah. I'm right. So <laughs> okay. there you go. I'm just going to, uh, possibly anticipating if one of these gentlemen's points, um, also I saw a lot of raised eyebrows. Just a point of clarification, Polly, given that the government said before the EU referendum, the government will implement what you decide, isn't it likely that most people assumed no, it was yeah, binding? Yeah, no, no, yeah. I, but, but, I mean, you know, the number of slight misstatements, catastrophic misstatements on all sides of that, would, would, I mean, you could write books and books of them. I'm, I'm just saying, in a, in a technical sense, mm. in a legal sense, it was legally advisory. That doesn't mean, I think, oh, the government can do what they like with it. Mm. I agree that a democratic mandate is constructed by the process of doing that. OK, thanks. Right, we, oh, God, so many hands. I'm afraid we've only got time to have... Uh, I'm going to take, try and take five, if you can promise to keep your comments to 30 seconds or under, and then we'll wrap up with the panel. So let's have, um, I'm going to go to this side here. So let's uh, start with you, and then you, and then these three here. Sorry, I can't take everyone, I'm afraid. But keep um, it 30 seconds or under, please. Uh, well, I think um, one point hasn't been discussed enough, which is that uh, democracy is a way of giving freedom to a society, so a free society is a democratic society. And I think one thing which has been underplayed is the idea that freedom is the freedom to make wrong decisions and to take risks. When the Athenians decided to go to war with the Persians, they had no idea what the consequences would be. So I think all this talk about informed decisions and etc. is downplaying the idea that freedom requires hard choices based on principle and not uh, focus on technicalities okay. because that's unpredictable. Got it, lovely. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit back to the 10-year-old. So we somehow assume that adults are capable of making informed and reasonable decisions compared to kids. Uh, why do you think so? I mean, everybody is super informed given all the media and internet, but they are also massively disinformed. And there is a lot of fake news, political technology that are affecting uh, decision making and how, how you can make sure that is not ruining democracy for everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Right, if we go back to the three that we agreed. One, two, three, there. 
on the left hand side, yeah. I was just going to say, I agree with Polly that you need a mix of direct democracy, representative democracy, maybe some elements of digital democracy, like was said. Um, but I just want to say to James, I think getting rid of the House of Lords before you have a House of Commons that can really scrutinise government, which our House of Commons cannot. I mean, you look at public bill committees in the House of Commons, I mean, MPs write their Christmas cards in public bill committees. These are meant to be committees that seriously scrutinise government legislation. There is not the structure in Parliament right now to seriously scrutinise government. And until that changes, getting rid of the House of Lords, which does scrutinise government because it doesn't have a government majority, is just completely pointless, to be honest, if you want to increase scrutiny of government. Okay, and the last one. Uh, James, you spoke a little bit about proportional representation at the start, I think, in terms of the election and how votes translate into seats. And I just wanted to know if you put that into practice. Um, how would you go about making decisions at a government level and how easy would that be since you don't have a strong majority anymore? Thank you. And we had, sorry, we had one last one, which I promised you. Yeah. Um, I just want to make a point about local and community level democracy, because it seems to me that, I mean, a big reason for a lot of people voting to leave the EU is because decisions feeling so far away from Westminster as well as the EU. Um, I'm a community organiser, and something that does is put um, power back to people in communities through community institutions, um, through holding local elected officials to account. And um, I just wondered if there were any reflections on how kind of local democracy can be enlivened as part of a vision for, for how we change things. Because um, I think this sort of digital idea, I worry that just would lead to people still feeling very disconnected and things feeling far away and not accountable. Lovely. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so we've got a, a range of uh, questions and comments about uh, democracy implying a freedom to, to screw up, basically. Um, uh, questions around informed decision-making, uh, defence of the House of Lords in the absence of, of something better, uh, and uh, issues also around the danger of um, separating people from each other even more via digital digitization of democracy. Um, we started off with uh, Polly, so I think I'm going to uh, invite the panel along this way to respond to those questions, but also to anything else that's been raised and to sum up. And if you can do all that in two minutes flat each, you'll be stars. Uh, great. So the lady here just said what I was trying to say, but better. So, yes, uh, there's endless fake news and misinformation out there. And my brother's mother-in-law was absolutely convinced that Turkey had already joined the EU, and that's why we had to leave. Uh, and she was wrong, but we shouldn't disenfranchise her because she was stupid, right? Um, but so I mostly want to talk about local democracy, and I think actually the digital stuff is really interesting, because in Taiwan, uh, so one of my colleagues, Carl Miller, has got a video about this that you can find about, about Taiwan's innovations. Actually, they do quite a lot of face-to-face -face engagement too, because uh, digital alone and the kind of the text-based stuff uh, doesn't give people that sense of connection and engagement. Uh, but I, I strongly agree with, um, uh, with what we were hearing earlier about this idea that actually people will be motivated and engaged and excited about decisions that they have been part of, even if those aren't technically, you know, the right decision, which so often, you know, a bunch of transport economists in the Department of Transport deciding exactly which roads and bridges get built is mostly just a way to piss everyone off. Uh, I keep coming back to a holiday I had in Bulgaria with my husband, and he, the worst catering of all time, I mean, honestly, the worst hotel ever. He went up to get me pudding and brought back a mouldy orange, and I'm like, what is wrong with you? Uh, and insisted on going back myself to check. And it was, in fact, just as he said, the best option. But because I, didn't, I hadn't been part of the decision-making process, I thought he was doing, doing it the dirty on me. And that is what we have done to so many places. We assume that they will understand that this crappy, crappy local economy that they're stuck with, just because it's marginally better than a counterfactual they never experienced, they're supposed to be grateful for it when they can still see, you know, a world of billionaires. So participative decision-making is a way to build legitimacy and engagement and also passion. Thanks, Polly. Uh, yes, I think one thing we can probably all agree on is that uh, local democracy should be enlivened and that um, uh, I mean, the key fit thing to, for doing that, I think, is empowering, em empowering local communities. Uh, it's not so much about... Well, it's partly about the structures within those local communities, but if you don't give power to local communities, then it's very difficult for people to get involved. Um, I thought the person uh, talking about proportional representation um, made a good point. 
Uh, I think it is really important when thinking about electoral systems to recognise there is no perfect electoral system. I've been studying electoral systems for several decades and I still can't come to a clear view as to which is best. Um, there are really good arguments for uh, majoritarian systems that, that uh, enable accountable government, which was a theme that we discussed earlier. If you have a simple party system, if the party system breaks down, then you don't. But there are very good arguments that James offered earlier for proportional systems as well. Um, I also basically agreed with the person who was co coming back to, to James about um, abolishing the House of Lords, Lords and the un undesirability of doing that before you've fixed the House of Commons. I mean, I think we shouldn't underestimate the good work that is done in the House of Commons. Uh, House of Commons select committees do a lot of really important, really good work, and that doesn't get enough recognition. And MPs do take their jobs seriously and do important stuff. Um, but they can't do everything. Um, and I think the kind of scrutiny that the House of Commons provides and the kind of scrutiny the House of Lords provides, they're just quite different things. And it's really important to have both. Um, I, on, of course, people have the right to make wrong decisions. The freedom to make wrong decisions is absolutely there and absolutely fundamental. But the problem with having a, a system in which you don't care about whether people can have access to information is kind of related to the person's point about fake news. You empower loud voices. You empower people who are willing to lie and manipulate if you don't have uh, an environment in which there's lots of good quality information out there as well. Um, so um, good quality information is fundamentally important, not just um, because it's important that we make informed decision making, but also because it sustains equality across the system. Thanks so much, Rosemary. Okay, yeah, so uh, regarding community democracy, yeah, it's obviously very important. However, it's also important not to get distracted uh, just by the local level. So a lot of the time when you start off with big ideas, people say, yeah, that's great, but why don't you do it locally? Uh, the reason is because local politics is constrained by national politics, right? They can starve you of your budget. They can give you directions on how to do things. So what we often have is this incentive to work a lot on the local level, but what you can do has already seriously been constrained on the national level. Um, that being said, for example, uh, participatory budgeting is a great example of something uh, that works, uh, it can work on a national level, but can also work on a local level. Um, as far as it not engaging, as digital not engaging people, well, it depends which people you're talking about. I've been involved in local politics in my area for quite a long time. Um, I was a member of one of our local political boards. I was the only person without gray hair on that board, and I've got a few grays, um, because they meet at 8 to 10 on a Wednesday evening. You know, it's very, very hard for people to get out and to go to meetings face to face. Um, it can really, digital can really, rather than exclude some people, and I, I, I know it can exclude some people, and that's why we kind of advocate both, uh, but it can also include people, you know, people who have a lot of other commitments, people who are time poor, which at this point, is most people living in suburban communities. Um, people with living with disability, people who have uh, difficulty speaking English as a foreign language, that can all actually help to facilitate those people who wouldn't be able to participate. Um, we also have to start rethinking about how we think about digital. This isn't like some HTML uh, texting. Um, you can see people face to face digitally now. Like when I first came to Europe, I used to occasionally phone my parents. Um, I went home once, my dad had gone bald in the meantime shocked the living daylights out of me. Um, now, of course, it's, you know, you Skype and you see people wandering through the background on their way to work. So we certainly have the technology now to enable a lot more like face-to-face -face experience than we would have before. Um, we're not all going to become cyborgs either. We're going to continue to exist in real life. So as far as just to round up quickly on fake news, um, well, the thing about democracy is that it is about people talking to each other. So when it comes down to information, we not only have an unequal system electorally, but also in the way we process information, um, because most information comes from newspapers or the news, where you're watching that passively. So someone might say something that, let's just say, is 100% incorrect, right? They say it's raining, it's not. Um, I might think that's BS, you might think that's BS, but we have no way to communicate that to each other. So actually, when people communicate more with each other, 
you know, directly on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, you can uncover what is true, what's not true. Like, is the hospital great in your area, like a politician just told me, or isn't it? You know, you're more in a position to say that than to I am, because I'm not there. Um, fake news, however, definitely isn't something new to the cyber age. Uh, someone mentioned the National Enquirer in a talk the other day. I'm really happy I'm not the only person who remembers that. Uh, we've had this for a really long time, playing a sort of undercurrent role. We've always had, you know, lies that we have to uncover. Okay. Jim. Um, uh, I, I don't think there's a technical solution to, to any of these problems, although doubtless there are technical means that, that, that could make things a bit better and a bit easier and, and all of these kind of things. I think, um, I mean, everything that I know about PR, I know from uh, reading Alan's uh, tremendous work on electoral systems. Um, so, I mean, I, I, on one level, I defer to his judgment about what the systems might look like. I think the reason why, having not been particularly a fan of, of electoral reform, um, even up to the point of the last referendum. The, the reason that, that I think I am now is because I think if we don't have um, uh, a legislative chamber that reflects the, the, the quite remarkable range of different positions and extremes of positions and conflicts of opinions that we have in society at the moment, then we can't actually get anywhere towards resolving any of those uh, divisions and disagreements. Because I think politics is about moving forward. Democracy is about moving forward. It is about finding the points where we disagree on fundamental issues and trying to move beyond them. And very often we don't move beyond them. Very often certain things will be points of principle and one side loses. So I think it's really important that we recognize having lost just about every time I've uh, uh, voted for something, I've been on the wrong side. We've all been in that experience. I think it's really important that we recognize that when you lose, you lose. Uh, you know, get over it. Try again next time. That's the way democracy has to function. But I think Ultimately, what this discussion is about for me is about what we think people are like, whether we think people are actually capable of, of making decisions, and certainly the more information, the better, but I don't, think we can, I, I don't think we should be in a position of challenging the decisions people made because we don't think they made them in the right way. I think ultimately you've got to say we trust citizens to make decisions. Here is lots of information. Here are the arguments. Here are the rows. Here's me knocking on the door telling you why you should do this and you arguing with me about why we do that. Trying to convince people of what the right thing to do is. And then people make those decisions. And when they make those decisions, we need representative uh, structures and we need direct uh, uh, decision-making structures. But we certainly still need representative structures which people can hold to account, which really means those structures, elected structures, need to do what they've said they're going to do. And if they don't, we need to be in a position to get rid of them. Ultimately, that's why I think simplifying that parliament structure, that legislative structure, is hugely important. But trust in, in, in people and in uh, our capacity to make decisions, I think, is hugely important. Great. Before we close, I've got one announcement that um, down in the Barbican shop at the mezzanine level, uh, Jim Panton will be signing his book, From Self to Selfie, as will Deborah Lipstadt. Those of you who saw the uh, anti-Semitism debate yesterday evening will have seen her on good form. Uh, she'll be signing her book, Anti-Semitism, here and now. Uh, I hope Jim's uh, final uh, passing shot was a very good note to close on, the need to trust the people. Um, thank you very much for taking part. I'm sorry we couldn't extend the franchise, as it were, to all of you. And please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.